Another edition of the early show with me, your host, Aidan Stone. <laughs> I tell you what, you wouldn't believe what's been going on backstage. There was Ed Sheraton out of the One Directions, and he'd fallen off his BMX, and he wasn't hurt, mind. But there was a bit of chaffing, and there was all the little mixes, and they were coming round with their casting their spells, and there was, uh, and they were laughing at his forehead hair. And uh, that was a terrible thing, a terrible thing. And uh, I bet it was all right, because then Miss Anders came and she was waving about some incense of soup or something. And then a glaze came over the scene and then there was just this sense, this sort of a, a relaxed sense of Hessian wall weave. And, uh, and then I woke up. Looks like someone's been in lockdown too long, mate. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? I've got something to show you. What? I can see your future. This is my crystal ball. What, that? It's a bit small. Well, your future's small. All right, I can see, I can see. OK, so uh, what, what can you see in it? I can see a lovely green face. Very attractive. Nice sharp teeth. Oh, that's my reflection. <laughs> You're no fun anymore. You've changed, you know that. What else can you see? I can see the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there will be sun. <laughs> I can see your whole future. It's all here, all mapped out in front of my really? eyes. What is it? It's a bit boring, really. More of the same, you know. I can see you getting up when you want, except on Wednesdays when you're rudely awakened by the dustman. I don't think you can see the future. I don't think anyone can see the future. I think the I think we 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 make our future by by the decisions that we make today in the present. Wait a minute! I can see someone. What? Who? There's somebody at the door. There's, There's somebody, somebody at the door. door. There's, There's somebody, somebody at the, the door. door. Who is it? I can see a man. A man. Yeah. A man. I'm getting a G and an F. G and an F. G and an F. It couldn't be Graham Frost. I mean. The G's right. Yeah. I think you better talk to him. I think I better have. Graham Frost, it's great not to have you with us this morning. It's great not to be there. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, there's a reason we're having a conversation this morning, and it's to do with it's to do with your story. Now I know you're working as a professional speaker, you've worked in learning and development for many years, but I want to go back, I want to go right back and tell us th that the, the story that is pretty unique. And, uh, and I, I think people will be quite interested to hear it. So what happened? What, what was your origin? What, what happened when you, were, when you were a teenager? Okay, so my origin, I was born into a fundamentalist Christian cult. So it's, that's the only thing I can refer to it as. It's very, very strict religion. Um, in, the, in the late 1950s, and you know it became obvious to me as i as i got a little bit older that uh, there was a world outside of that so i was you know i was brought up in a family where i had cousins and church members as friends and i wasn't allowed to have friends at school for one thing you know so i, got, I wasn't allowed to have any friends outside of the outside of the church which i found very restricting and so um, long story short, at the age of 17, I decided to leave. And that meant that I had to make this big, big massive decision to leave my whole family behind. And, and uh, in fact, I didn't see my mother for 27 years after that. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I'm not suggesting that anybody else should do that, by the way. Uh, but that was a decision, a life-changing decision. And on balance, I don't regret it. And then I came out of that uh, cocooned environment into the big wide world and um i fell into some bad company over the next couple of years and by the time i was 19 so two years after i left home i was in a young offenders institution which in those days was called a borstal i was a borstal boy 
And while I was in the Borstal, um, one of the officers in there had a conversation with me, which changed my life. And he said, you're not a criminal. What are you doing here? You know, he said, you're not like some of the lads that we get here. He said, you've got an opportunity now to change your life. I suggest you go and look in the mirror and decide who you really want to be. And so I did. I went back and sat on my bed in the dormitory at the Borstal and thought about what I was going to do with the rest of my life and decided that I wasn't going back into a place like that. And, you know, I've got to the reasonably advanced age of 63 and I haven't actually, I haven't been in trouble again. And, and um, you know, so, you know, that, that decision worked. And, um, and so then... A few years later, I'd settled down, got a reason to get. I worked on the railway for many years, but uh, I just started work on the railway, got myself a young lady in my life, and I contracted uh, testicular cancer. So that was, um, that was quite a nasty experience. I don't recommend it. It wasn't a decision you can make. You can't decide not to get that. Yeah. What you can decide when you get something like that is to have a positive attitude. And I'm not saying that a positive attitude will cure you of cancer because it won't, because the National Health Service, the people who are doing such a fantastic job uh, now are the people that cured me of that. And to, uh, I'm still here to sell that tale. So, you know, I think that, you know, I, I kind of worked out just quite recently that all the big decisions I made in my life, and there's quite, there's obviously been quite a lot more because I'm quite old, um, were actually made with the heart rather than with the head or more there was more heart than head involved and um, you know even up to the present day you know I just recently moved to Birmingham from Peterborough which is only 90 miles but it's quite a big thing to do in your early 60s I did that because I did that because of um, my partner who lives in Birmingham and I wanted to be closer to her so I'm still making heart-shaped decisions even even at the age I'm at now so that's kind of, that's a little bit about my story. That's an interesting phrase. Is that that's the phrase you've you've come up with that you use heart based decisions? That heart shaped decisions, yeah. Heart shaped decisions. I like it, yeah. Heart shaped good. decisions, yeah. yeah. That, that's um I think I think I think there's a need for more heart shaped decisions in the world, generally. You know, make decisions with your heart rather than your head. So at, at school, did did were you prepared for making decisions at school? What, you know, do you do you think we prepare kids enough to be able to think about their future and make decisions? What's your view on on where you came from with that? I don't think I was. I think I went. To, you know, I went to a comprehensive school. My schooling was in Essex and London, and I went. The last school I was at was a comprehensive school in the East End of London, and. I can remember getting to the end of my sort of uh, GCSE year and I was told that I, uh, I wasn't allowed to stay at school and do A-levels. So that, that because my dad said I had to get out and get a job because I was the eldest of six and, um, and needed to contribute to the family. And um, I went to a careers officer and she pulled a file out of a, out of a filing cabinet and said, so I've, got, I've got just a job for you, Graham. And I, I, I went and got... She sent me for an interview to be an office junior in an office in, in Shoreditch in the East End of London. And I went through the interview and I got the job. And after probably about six or seven months, I realised I didn't really want to work in an office. And um, so I, I actually, part of my sort of leaving home process was that I, I stopped working in offices. In fact, I went and worked behind the bar in a pub when I left home. And I did that for quite a long time, and that took me almost by accident into hospitality, which is where I worked for you know, a lot of my life. I actually worked serving customers and uh, you know uh, delivering customer service. So that yeah, that was um, and that you know that is a job that is now becoming you know appreciated in the current climate where you know people who work in supermarkets where we kind of have maybe have taken them for granted now we're actually going out on the street and applauding them on a on a thursday evening yeah so we, yeah we, it, so yeah you know i think i think i think there's kind of a things are being better, turned upside down at the minute yeah we almost want we almost recognizing that we we we, we live in or we should be living in a heart-shaped community aren't we that these that key workers yes. that, that the ones you mentioned they're um they're more vital 
and, and and more deserving of our our gratitude and thanks and pay than than we perhaps realised than we perhaps realised over the past so. years. So, mm, I this, think so I think I, I hope. Yes, go on. Sorry. Oh yeah, I'm saying these heart shaped decisions that we're that we're talking about now. As you know, we uh, after we have our little chat with your little story there, we we meet in our tutor groups and we. We yeah. try. We, we try something to reflect on. What do you think we should be? We should be talking about and reflecting on uh, after after this. Well, I think you know. I think I mean you know this was never talked about when I was at school, but you know I think it's about you know making decisions about who our friends are. Are that are our friends the sort of people that are, that that are going to move us forward and, and support us, or you know are, who who are we who are we actually being friends with and who. And who who are we using as our role models? Who do you know? Who do we want to be like? Um, one of the reasons why I left my whole environment at seventeen is I didn't really have any people that I want. There was no inspiration. Who you know? So think about who inspires you. Maybe there's somebody in. You know, maybe there's somebody in your your tutor group or elsewhere in the school that inspires you that you want to be like. You know, I didn't have anybody like that in my life when I was growing up. Mm. And that's why I probably I, I left my family and everything else behind to go in, in search of inspiration. Fortunately, I found it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still here, hopefully, inspiring other people a little bit now. But I think, you know, look, look for people who inspire you. Look for people who make you feel good, who build you up and not drag you down. I think that's, that's what I would say. It's interesting, I was reading uh, yesterday, that uh, a lot of young people uh, admire YouTubers, these people on the internet who <coughs> have their own shows on the internet, uh, a bit like this, but they, they promote products. Mm. So they get paid by advertisers and, and products and selling, selling stuff. And, uh, yeah. and, and suddenly I think a lot of these people are falling out of favor with, with, with younger people. It's like as if, like we've just been saying, we just suddenly realized, hang on a minute, it's a bit, a bit inappropriate, isn't it? That's trying to get me to buy more stuff. I think there's more important things in life. So I think, yeah, reevaluation of who your heroes are is quite an interesting, interesting one to do. To, to, to interesting thing to look at. And also, I'd be interested in, in uh, for myself and for my tutor group to think, what decisions have we made in our life so far that we we, we go through life so quick, especially when you're younger. You do mm. this, you do that, you do that. And you don't really think that you actually are on a path. And even though things don't seem to change very quickly, there are decisions we've made about friendships, about direction, about choice of subjects, about other things, about hobbies, decisions that set us up on a path. So I'd be interested in talking to, talking to our students about what decisions have we already made that have already yes. influenced for good or bad and, and recognise mm. I think when you recognise what you're talking about, the power of decisions... Um, if we recognise them, then we can like, take control of them and make better heart-shaped decisions for the future. Yeah, I think it's about you know I think it's about how you feel about that decision in yourself. I mean, it took me a very long time to decide to leave home. It wasn't something I woke up one morning and decided to do. You know, the the, the process of making that decision probably started when I was about twelve. And I realised that you know there's, there was something else out there that that I found I found interesting, and um, potentially more inspiring and more you know more uh, more um, I don't know just drew me to what you know I was always told we were brought up to believe that we were in the world but not of it, and I actually wanted to be of the world. I wanted yeah. to be like everybody else, um, and I think. You know, I think I was, I was never encouraged to be myself. So I think another decision to make, you know, when you're kind of, you know, when you're young, 15, 16, however old you are, you don't really know who you are. Um, I, and I didn't. I didn't know who I was when I was 17, but I knew who I wasn't, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And I knew yeah. I didn't. Yeah. You know, that, that was, um, that was that, you know, a decision I made. I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently because... We all had time on our hands, and think I was thinking. You know, I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted, but I did. I knew what I didn't. What want. I didn't want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting and that I think. Yeah. That. That's. Um, yeah. You. You might not know exactly what you want at the yeah. age of you know fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. You probably won't. But uh, maybe you can decide now what you don't want. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's interesting that the word decision means to cut off doesn't it, it means to cut off from and mm. your your example is uh probably the most brutal version of that to be cut off from your family especially for for 27 years you know that's that that has there has to be some resolve there to be able to to make a decision as big as that and i hope that a lot of us our decisions aren't quite as brutal as that you know and that we i hope you know i hope you know i hope nobody listening to this or watching this ever has to make that decision uh, that's the old you know for me that was the ultimate decision yeah. but i don't regret it because i've had i've had a life I've had a really interesting life. I'm still having a really interesting <laughs> life, actually. You know, <laughs> just, you know, just because I'm a little bit older, you can still have an interesting life. You know, you have to keep um, you have to keep making those decisions as yeah. you go through life. Well, I think it was a great decision um, having a chat to you this morning. So, uh, Graham, thanks for uh, having a chat to us this morning, and uh, all the best with your next decisions. And uh, thank you. And uh, great, thanks for having me with us. Thank you very much for having me, it's been a privilege, thank you. Now, if you're like me and you need to do some learning during the lockdown, get some facts in your noodle box, then you might like to try this accelerated learning technique. Right, so get a bracket like this and then attach a raisin to each corner. Now, I ran out of raisins, so I had to use an olive, but it'll still work. Now, these represent Newton and his three draws of lotion. Never step on a rabbit. Um, number two is equal to the other two on the other side and every action as an equal and opposite fraction. Then get a um, toilet roll, don't use a real one, that will be disgusting, and uh, sellotape that on and stuff it full of used grass like that. Now that represents King Henry Tudor and his nine lives. There was Peedy Weedy, Ichabod, Freeman Hardy and Willis, and great big hoddy man Todd. And then, then put that on for maths. Then hold it above your head and let it suck all the goodness in. And then I woke up. Mm -hmm.